The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. I'm your host, Jackson, and in today's episode, I sit down with Paul Bavel from the History Rage podcast to discuss his content creation journey, his approaches to historical content creation, living history, how to get into it, what it's like. But also, I ask him some really nice questions about how he got into history, and it's really interesting to find out how other people get into history and become interested in it. Now, if you do enjoy this episode and if you enjoy all the other episodes that we put out, please do consider supporting History of Jackson through History of Jackson Plus in Apple Podcasts or through the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below. Now, without further ado, I'll leave you with Paul. So hello and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. Today, we are joined by friend of the podcast, historian and podcaster, Paul Bavel. Paul is one of the hosts behind the amazing History Rage podcast. How are you doing, Paul? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I've just about recovered from Gloucester. Yeah. Oh, God. I can imagine you were absolutely prolific at Gloucester. <laughs> yeah. If you've got any podcast types out there that are listening, if you ever have that bright idea of I'm going to do six episodes in six days, don't. Oh, God. Yeah, it's, it's knackering. It is absolutely knackering. So I oh, oh, well done for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They keep hinting that I should come back and do it again. It's like I probably want to rein it back a bit. <laughs> Go to sleep halfway through. Yeah, yeah. I think I was up until my record was quarter past midnight when I finished editing one episode. Oh, lovely stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's how podcasters live, everyone. Yeah, no, I, I, w- I wouldn't recommend it, but... It is what it is, really, isn't it? So, yeah. I mean, when else were we going to get the opportunity for that? So I thought, yeah, you know. And if everybody says yes, I just didn't want to decline anyone. Oh, oh yeah, you can't say no. But it's an interesting point, really, talking about podcasting, talking about history, and, and Gloucester History Festival. I kind of want to start off by asking you, you know, how did you become interested in in history? Okay, so my interest in history is. It's not like typical historians, but there's probably going to be a lot of people out there that go, oh, yeah, that's that's just me. That's me right on there. So um, I don't actually have a history qualification to my name at all. Uh, I was informed by school I should not take the history GCSE because I would almost certainly fail it. And there my kind of education in history ended. And although I do take a lot of pride in going to school reunions and telling my history teacher, oh yes, I run a history podcast, I speak at history festivals and so forth, he was actually probably right uh, at that point. Because I had this string of history teachers and there were people out there that are going, yeah, I identify with that. that I had a string of history teachers that just made history the worst subject in the world. I mean, when I come to do GCSE choices and I'm actively choosing geography over history, come on. But well, they were right. I mean, I had a history teacher that managed to make the Wars of the Roses dull. The Wars of the Roses, right? Like Game of Thrones without the dragons, and yet they made it dull. That yeah, is just an unbelievable conflict to be able to make <laughs> so dull. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're not, you know, where we were in the centre of Leeds, where I'm not five miles away from the longest and bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil. Battle of Towton, right in the middle of the Wars of the Roses. Absolutely decisive. I was 18 when I found out that was a thing. I mean, it started off really good. I don't want to go like completely dump on all my history teachers. It started off great. The first time that I actually was taught history at school, I was about eight. And we had a history teacher that was a member of the Richard III Society. And he taught us for the first term, we did the Battle of Hastings, the Battle of Agincourt, the Battle of Bosworth. Oh God, the way to get a classroom full of eight-year-old lads interested in history. I was absolutely rabid for it. Unfortunately, then, everything became three-field farming techniques, and then who invented the spinning jenny, the rotating Mildred, the oscillating Deirdre, and so forth. You know, we've covered the Industrial Revolution in terms of who invented particular machines that meant you could spin wool. You know, I I, I want unions, Luddites, protests, machine breakers, the Peterloo massacre, but no. No, that wasn't that wasn't part of that. Um, and so I would carry on until I eventually just completely fell asleep with, with the idea of history. And then I left school. And suddenly I discovered something. And this is actually a reason why I've not gone back and done any history qualifications since. 
either is what I found is when I could pick and choose the history, then I get interested in it like to a rabid level. I mean, lockdown, most people sat in lockdown while they were getting furlough or having to work and they did their thing. And some people set up podcasts and some people set up, you know, YouTube channels and some people started blogging or just reading. Do you know what I did? I investigated local cases of body snatching and attempted to find the graves where they were stolen from. And I went in on this. It's such a fascinating crime. Um, that I'd got all this time, I'd got access to the British newspaper archive, I've got access to the censuses, and great. I'm going to, somebody had written in, well, I say somebody, God, I'm doing her a disservice here. There's a lady called Susie Lennox, wrote a brilliant book on body snatchers. It's like, if you're, if you're entry level looking for, you know, information on body snatching, her book, Body Snatchers, absolutely brilliant book. Novix is written by a historian, although she's great, but she was an archivist. It's one of the best indexed books I've ever read. And she, she had a line in there that just said the body of 15 year old Martha Roddy was stolen from a churchyard in Armley in Leeds and it was returned to its original grave after her uncle offered a reward. And that was it. And I thought, well, I'd live near Armley. I'm, I, I'm going to find Martha Roddy. And over the course of that year, I managed to find where not only who she was, but what she did for a living, roughly the parish that she lived in. Um, I went across the industrial museum. They went through what she did for a living, actually let me try it. Then the then I tracked where the body was stolen from, what she died from, where the, who bought the body, where it was discovered. And I just want to build this map until eventually it was Christmas Eve when the church warden and the local history group got in touch with me and said, we found an archaeological survey of the graveyard. We've got a copy of the headstone. And from there, I could find the original grave where it happened from. So I, I managed to research a full this is somebody who, you know, was going to sleep in history classes, has managed to re- do the full post-death journey of Martha Roddy. Uh, and it's that's so when you can pick and choose what you're interested in. Oh, God, the world is your oyster. And, uh, and then I got into the living history side of things where I met my wife. We met on opposite sides of the Wars of the Roses. Oh, um, risky. <laughs> yeah, I was in a Yorkist household. She was in a Lancastrian household. Uh, we, we used to settle arguments by whatever battle was coming up next, you know. So fine, I will see you on the field of Tewkesbury then. Yeah, I think that's a great way to settle that. <laughs> yeah, you know. so it's already predetermined, you know. I knew, I knew if it was coming up to Bosworth, I was going to lose that argument. <laughs> yeah, don't um, start an argument around Bosworth then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, just, and, but again, that really makes you then go and learn which battles your side lost. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and hold that in your memory. You know, yeah, Edgecote Moor. I'm avoiding that one. Uh, and then you've then I've got into the festivals since then uh, and kind of really found my really found my niche so that that is a potted history of how I got from kind of there to to roughly here I think I think it's quite you know it's actually polar opposite to a lot of people that I spoke about is that you didn't come into it from some amazing history teacher um you know I'm very grateful for my history teacher I had an amazing history teacher in sixth form but that's that's how I got back into history. Meanwhile, it's it's what turned you off, um, which is you no. Know, I, I think that's really really interesting, actually, that history teachers can. Um, I mean, teachers as in general, not me, because I am also a teacher, uh, <laughs> can can make or break your interest in the subject. I just think if they'd have come at it in the same style that my science teachers did, because I ended up going to more down the route of scientist and studied chemistry and then human physiology which again links nicely back into body snatching because it was I, I was an anatomy student but they they you know chemistry was exciting stuff changed color it exploded you know that that was that was things that you wanted to get interested in you you were learning the makeup of the universe and stuff like that and you know even like physics made maths interesting oh you know, if physics can be interesting History can be interesting, but people didn't tell it as a story. I kind of grew up. I mean, I'm nearly fifty now. I grew grew up in that that generation where it was it, it was a lot of dates and it was a lot of things and it was a lot of facts, you know. But nobody ever taught you really how to go away and research something, how to think about it from a different angle. So there was a lot of potentially being told what to think rather than how to think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's the best way to teach history is how to think and let let kids make up their own mind but it is a shame that we can't you know let off cannons in history classes or (laughs) give give all the kids like a broadsword or so on just so they can know what it was like to be on the battlefield at bosworth or hastings Mm. or something 
Well, you say that. I did. I used to do. I used to do a thing for schools, which was like a taste of national service, and you would like, parade all the kids out on the ground and everything like that, and they you know, give them a, give them a reasonably weighted wooden rifle each and things like that, and then you would you would drill them and take them through the the various routines. And I used to get comments from teachers there that, that I'd never seen their children that obedient that quickly before. Um, one headmaster had said to me, well, how did you get Ryan to behave? And it was very simple. He either did what I said, or I put two bricks in a small pack and he ran around the playground until he did what I said. Uh, and that was that taste of that kind of military culture shock. I mean, it was just a taste. I wasn't going to put them through basic training by the <laughs> stretch, you know, but ju- just a taste. And it got through to those kids. I mean, I, I'll say that I have, I, I have, you know, dumped on my school. There was, there was one moment in uh, in my school history which really engaged me with history. And sadly, it was the rest of it following that that kind of killed it off. But we had a maths teacher. Our head of maths was actually a D-Day veteran. He landed on Sword Beach. And when we had a school trip to Normandy, uh, so when about in his second year of the junior school, so it was about nine, ten. And there was this school weekend trip to, to Normandy and you go all over and so forth. And... So he took us to he took us to the Normandy beaches, some of them at least. And meanwhile, every all the teachers have been off and bought pretty much every firework and firecracker that they could possibly find in Cherbourg area. And six o'clock in the morning, with our feet in the English Channel, we stormed Utah Beach as all that lot went off. And it didn't teach me a damn thing about D-Day, but it really made me want to learn about it. But sadly then, I never got to learn about it until I left school. That is that is a real shame, actually. But I think, you know, at least he was able to give you something that you could build off. Working from that then, so getting interested in history in your, in your adult life, developing your own research interests. So where does the inspiration for, for History Rage come from then? It was quite accidental because actually what we started to do is we'd, we'd been doing the Living History Group, which we'll talk about a little later on, I believe. Uh, but we'd, we'd been doing Living History for quite a while. What we wanted to do is we wanted to do some video work. So we'd like make some short sort of like five, ten minute documentaries or, or something like that. And then lockdown landed. So we ended up kind of just doing. We have a group YouTube channel, Foreign, Fist, Foreign Field Living History. It is mostly me just giving 10-minute history bites about things that I find bizarre. Um, but once all that ended, we were, we were then back down at the Chalk Valley History Festival. And we were looking to do some video work, but we weren't really sure what. And I latched onto this idea of, right, why don't we do kind of between one and three-minute shorts that we could put on like Instagram Reels or TikTok or something like that. And what we did is we grabbed speakers that we knew and said, right, will you just give us three minutes on what you wish everyone would just stop believing? And, and that seemed to work very well. There wasn't a huge amount of engagement with it via the, the YouTube channel and stuff like that. But we thought, well, this is getting us to know a few people and widening the spheres. Let's carry it on. Uh, and then, then it dawned on us that I, you know, I, I live in West Yorkshire and Kyle lives in Staffordshire and most of history appears in the southeast. So we're not going to be in a position to video anybody anytime soon so why don't we do this as a podcast and and it just exploded from there. I mean, when we started we thought we're going to run out of friends by like mid series two it, if that we we knew very few people in the history community at all um yesterday i recorded episode 106 it's just we've had people coming just out of the woodwork now going oh this thing annoys the hell out of me so so I want to get on this. But yeah, we basically then we go, we get people on, we ask them a little bit about their background and their work. And then we ask them, okay, what is the one thing that you wish everybody would just stop believing? And we've had like, oh, lions were not led by donkeys. We've had the Battle of Britain is not a close run thing. It was an absolute whipping. Um, we've had Braveheart does not represent anything about William Wallace or Scotland. Uh, Operation Sea Lion was dead in the water. Um, you know, we've done we've done a few kind of like cagey controversial ones as well. Like, you know, we we had uh, Chris Sams from History Hack on. He came he came on to do well. Yeah, British lost the Battle of Jutland. You know, <laughs> just had Josh Proven on to record. Um, the, the Charge of the Light Brigade was not a single success at all. I mean, Josh is a great historian. Josh yeah, is yeah, just. great talker. Um, so I think yeah, that's, I'm looking forward to listening to that one. But I like. I like how you develop that. 
you know, it's a it's a really nice concept being able to because I don't think we we ever as historians, I don't think we ever just sit there and go. Apart from to our families and friends, yeah. I absolutely hate this that everyone's doing this, but we all end up <laughs> having to write stuff or or produce stuff. Just going, ah, oh, tell this story because people want to li- listen to this story. Yeah, yeah, no, so enough enough Tudors and Nazis. Thank you very much. You know. <laughs> Yeah, oh God. Yeah, don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were surprised that nobody had ever thought of this before because the number of historians that are just cheesed, in fact, I forget who it was, but um, his, his, his wife told me, it's like, great, you've given him an outlet that means I can watch war films with him because he'll stop shouting at the TV and just get in touch with you guys. I think if you're able to, you're providing fam- family therapy there. I think that's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've often been described as somewhere you can get more confrontational with history than you can with anywhere else. Uh, so people do come on, and we get a lot of comments to say that, you know, that was really cathartic. That, that people could just, and even some of our quietest and most civil and polite historians, I mean, Helen Fry, you know, absolutely lovely woman. Uh, her first, we 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 were almost we we almost had to cut this bit because she started going off. Well, Nazis shouldn't have an apostrophe in it. And I thought, are you actually a grammar Nazi about the word Nazis? Um, but she was really nice and polite. And then she's she actually booked her third rage to to rage about Mata Hari. So she keeps coming back. Peter Caddick Adams came back. Came, did one to do. You know, the Nazis were not a technological powerhouse. And then he really came on to rip apart Montgomery. I th- yeah, I, I mean, hearing I've listened to the Helen ones, and every time she's like, "But that's a separate rage, but that's a separate <laughs> rage." So that's it's brilliant. This, but like jumping on those comments and you know the family therapy thing, what of what's the what's the reaction been then to producing history in this way? Because obviously you, your your podcast guests absolutely love doing it. it; gives them an outlet that they're not able to fulfil anywhere else. But what's the reception been like to it? Um, well, we haven't had any bad feedback, so that's uh, that's always a good thing. We do occasionally get comments back that oh, you know, I was expecting people to be a bit angrier, or was expecting people to be a bit swearier. Um, although, if people are you know if they, people are looking for a swear fest, I generally direct them towards the Alex Churchill and Chris Kempsell episodes, where we're absolutely blue uh, to to the point of where you start to think, should I put a bleep in there? But no, I'm going to go. I, I'm going to go with that. But people seem to be enjoying it because it was. It goes back to that school thing. It's making making history interesting. It, I think we get people to think about history in a completely different way, and not just to accept the facts that you're told, but actually it encourages a certain level of questioning. You know, within that, we we have this like unofficial tagline of the podcast, which is, "Well, when you put it like that, yes." You know, I'll give give you an example. When I Alex Churchill came on, and her rage was the lions were not led by donkeys, uh, and she her opening gambit was, "You cannot get to what is effectively director level over a lifelong career in the British Army in one of the most." dangerous and horrific environments that had been seen at the time and be a complete moron you just can't do it i was like actually yes you know you don't get to that rank by being an idiot when you know you're not purchasing a commission anymore you, know, you don't get to be general of the first army by being a complete idiot inviting that sort of thing and we 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 like to do it in a you know in a good kind of like ragey angry way that people can have fun with and people would enjoy listening to but it also it gets that passion for history across you're sounding somebody like you're hearing somebody else that is being passionate and excited about that subject and that spreads i I, I, that is certainly what i've got from it listening to it is listening to people's passion because it's actually their historical passion, not some some book that they've been told by a publisher to come and speak to someone about or something like that. It's you can feel that, and it's actually really nice to listen to people get that off their chest. I I really like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> no, that's you. all right. No, of course. I mean, a lot of people give me credit for it, but really, I don't do the work there. I just sit there and listen to people run and occasionally go, mm, "Yes." Yeah, I think that's the best thing about being a host. You just <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Certainly better than being a YouTube presenter. It really is. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, I like doing my beard, but I couldn't do it every week. So, <laughs> but yeah. what, what, what challenges then? Because public history is a re- really quite a difficult sphere to kind of produce content in, get, get seen, get heard. So what challenges have you had in trying to share and, and discuss history, especially, you know, when you're talking about some quite contentious areas for some people? Yeah, well, we've had, you know, it, it's not been plain sailing all the way. Uh, we had, as all podcasters have, you kind of launch your first episode and nobody listens to it. <laughs> At all. Just, first episode is August the 28th, 2021. And we had eight downloads in the first month. And I'm thinking, oh, God, what the hell? Uh, but I thought, I'll keep going. I'll give it at least kind of a, a, a couple of months. And it started to pick up a little bit. We were throwing it out on social media, but we didn't have the big following there. And the thing is, we also, we didn't have some sort of celebrity guest uh, as well, or in fact, celebrity host. You know, you look at something like We Have Ways of Making You Talk, you've got the combination of James Mar- James Holland and Al Murray, and boom, that's going to go all over the place, isn't it? Uh, and we just we just didn't have that. Um, thankfully, James agreed to be a guest for Series 1, and that really did put our listener figures up, and a lot of them then stayed. And then to actually get it up to the level where it was at now, it really was a case that I think it's Ian Sanders from... Cold War Conversations said to me, back catalogue is key because people will download your episode and then they will like it and then they will go and download your entire back catalogue and listen to that, which is, which I love you people that do that. Or if you could just make one slight tweak to that is that people will like listen to episode 76 and then they will go download the rest and then they will start at episode one and work forward. And please don't. What I would like you to do is start at episode 75 and work backwards. Because people go in and go, I really like that. And then they go and listen to the worst audio editing I have ever done in my career at episode one. It's like, I can't even listen to it now. It's shameful. Yeah, I think we've all, we've all been in that spot, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> your first one, like, camera angles off. You do, you're just using your phone or something. But, you know, I, I get that. You know, when you're starting off with no celebrity guests it is it is quite difficult and it was a it was a stretch um to to get it going and i think i think even when even when we'd had james on you know we were having a little bit of a celebration because that's the time that we first hit more than 100 downloads on release day you know now if we get less than 1200 downloads on release day i think i'm having a bad day yeah it's it's when you don't hit those 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 numbers that you're accustomed to and you're used to it it is it yeah, is quite tough. Wrong, so everybody switched off. Oh yeah. my God, did I accidentally say something, you know, that accidentally support the SS or something? I don't know. <laughs> and yeah, so that was one challenge. So then the other challenges that we've had is really to be just taken seriously. I mean, it, it is, I wouldn't say it's a saturated market. It isn't, you know, everybody's got their, everybody's got their niche and can do it. But you are fighting to be heard over a whole lot of other things, and the most of which are bigger than a starting podcaster is. And it's, it's taken us about two years to to actually get taken seriously. And you get so you get at the start, you're like, and I love this. I've had a uh, you get at the start, you reach out to guests, and I've had a few people that come back and gone. I, I don't think this is for me, really. And they're okay, moving on, I can I can cope and so forth. But a couple of those have now approached me to see if they can come on the show and I'm thinking, ha <laughs> ha. You know, so to get to that, there is a certain level of there's a certain level of snobbery within the history community. You know, can't can't hide from it. There are there are, and this crops up with academics and authors more than other more than other fields it's not it's by no means all of them you know love my academics but uh, they and they they're like because you know i don't even have a history gcse kyle has got a history degree but that's that, that's where it ends and and people people think that we're not historians or that we don't it's like i appreciate you know some people they 
I know people that, you know, 20, 26, 27 years old have got a PhD. It's like, great. You know, you, you left school six years ago. I've been studying history since I was 18. You know, I haven't sat any exams on it. I haven't written any books on it. But that doesn't mean that I haven't been studying primary sources. It doesn't mean that I haven't been doing the same work that everybody else has been doing. I've just done different things with it. And that that can get annoying. Yeah, that can get really annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's... You know, I like the caveat about so not all of them because it is true. It's not all of them, it's but they're... by no means all of them. It's not even most of them. You know, oh no, it's, it, it's, it's such a tiny, small section. Yeah, but it is, it is one of those things that's there, and you you get so frustrated by it. Like I, whilst I have my my history degree, my second degree, um, you know, first of all, I'm a history teacher, and then my second degree is in politics. You know, I get some. Well, you didn't stay in history, or you know, I'm I'm in my twenties. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's another thing that crops up as well. It's like, oh yeah, you can't be you can't be that serious, you're in your twenties. So, you know, there's there's whole I will say that for anyone listening, yeah, you know, there is there is whole there's barriers that you kind of need to to get over. But once you're taken seriously, I think that's the best. Once you like, if you recognise yeah. or take it seriously, it's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you found this. We found this at a few of the history festivals that we've been to as well, that like people would come up and go, You're the history rage guys. You go, Yeah, this guy, I recognise the voice. So like, yes. never knew what anything what I looked like, but they recognise the voice. I yeah, when I've when I've been recognised, I was like, Oh, you you're from this. Yes. Yeah, is it, is it, have, have I done anything? Like <laughs> <laughs> But it is a brilliant feeling. I think it's it's one of the yeah. best. Yeah, I yeah. Can't, you it's, can't beat it. It's taken us a while. Like I say there there is this kind of unwritten rule within podcasting that it, it takes you two years to get to get to get taken seriously and to be remotely successful. I think there's a little bit of truth to that because when people look at a new podcast, they think most podcasts fail within the first two years because people just give up because nobody's listening. Yeah, and therefore, if you've managed to keep going two years somebody's listening to you yeah exactly somebody's listening to you then it's a lot easier to get other people to come in and listen to you as well it's still a challenge to get people to pay five pound a month for joining us on patreon but yeah yeah i think yeah i think i moved i changed format so i started off doing weekly videos for myself just doing video essays basically and then i moved into just doing monthly podcasts which this year i actually realized well the reason why i'm not having any growth or any sustained growth is because i'm not publishing enough mm. and then since i moved to that weekly format it's been like oh wow like people are people are listening yeah so yeah. It's, we it's, used to do fortnightly and what i found and i still find this now because we up until recently we were doing we'd do like a series break where we'd have a week off in between a series and I'd come back, so we'd release a fortnight later. And I'm struggling to get all my listeners back at that point. It's like, you've got to keep that momentum going. Yeah, yeah. I think momentum, momentum is key, really, in it. Because, I mean, you also have to have the passion in it as well. If you can't keep that passion going, then what, why are you doing it? But <laughs> I want to talk about your other passion as well. Okay. Um, and you've mentioned it before, but it's, it's, it's living history. So, yeah. Some of the listeners might not know what it is, but could you let us know what living history is? Okay, so stand by because this is going to be quite wide ranging because living history gets referred to with a lot of very interchangeable terms that have very different meanings to very different people. So what I'm about to give you is my take on the, the wider sort of history, living history, reenactment kind of community. So you can basically, I think you've got to break it down to four, four types. So what you've got is reenactors. You know, everybody think of, you know, living historians, they're going to think reenactors, they're going to think people like the English Civil War Society, the Sealed Knot, the, the Anglo Saxon Society, the Viking Society, and, uh, uh, and so forth. And so what reenactors are doing is, broadly speaking, they're reenacting and i will put that in inverted commas because they you know you just you, you really can't you know these i i was a i, I was a reenactor at the start I, myself you know we the first battle that i took part in was the it was a recreation of the first battle of st albans which was for the 550th anniversary 
uh, of the the first battle of St Albans and so we actually fought it in St Albans town center exactly where the first battle in fact we ended it just under the little plaque that marked where the death of the Bo- duke of beaufort was we we covered the ground but the thing is there was probably about 300 of us in that it's like the Battle of St. Albans was fought with 7,000 people as a bloody street fight. You know, you just cannot do it justice with that. But it's, it's fun and it's a spectacle and you can't help but enjoy it. I mean, once you've been in so many battles, they kind of get a bit dull after the while. But, but, and people have this idea with reenactment as well that we get pissed off that we lose all the time. Uh, and that's, uh, it's like, we, we know which ones we're going to win and which ones we're going to lose. We we turn up and we're okay with that. You know, that. That is a big myth. So you've got your battle reenactor that will be like Civil War Musketmen or Pikemen. And generally what they'll do is they'll turn up at the event. They'll turn up on the field. They'll play their part in the battle. And they don't necessarily do a great deal else. It's fun. Oh boy, is it enjoyable. There are a few things in the world as stress relieving as, like you say, firing a cannon. And that's your sort of reenactor level. You do have a level that's below that that you find very much in the 1940s scene, and that is what I call the promenade. And what they will do is they will turn up in some form of uniform of wildly de- degrees of accuracy, They're almost cosplayers. Uh, and they will go and enjoy a day out at a heritage railway for their 40s weekend or something like the, uh, something like the Pickering War weekend. I've broken you there, haven't I? You, yeah, you've you you really broke me with that one. Yeah, the cosplay comment. Yeah. That. Um, no, I don't. You no, know, just whatever whatever floats your boat. Go out and have fun, you know. And I will say that something like the Pickering Wartime Weekend, it knows what it is. And a lot of people go, oh, "It's an educational event." It isn't. It is a rose tinted nostalgia fest, and there is nothing wrong with that. No, no, nothing wrong at all. Uh, you know, it's lots of, but the, the, there's lots of singers, there's lots of ladies in fur coats. You'd be forgiven for thinking there was ever a shot fired in anger in the entire war. Uh, there was a parade through Pickering Town Centre, which I took part in once, and I was the only person there that was badged lower than the rank of lieutenant. So I was the only one that turned up in a party. And I that air I'm private, covered in like charcoal dust and ash and stuff like that, like I've actually been on a battlefield schlepping along at the back of this while various colonels with more gold braid than general galtieri swanned around at the front um i kid you not i went into a pub to have a pint i found four general montgomery sat around a table having a pint with each other a lot of the people that do that will claim that they are reenactors and not really notice that difference and that that does cause a lot of arguments in a lot of uh, in a lot of places so you've got that side of things and then you've got really what i would call the living historian okay and the living historian is then doing they they are not so much living and breathing it, but there's a lot of demonstrating things that go on in there. So if you go to say the Battle of Bosworth, less so the Battle of Tewkesbury. If you go say the Battle of Bosworth, what you'll do is you you can watch the battle and you can see all the swords and you can hear all the cannons and stuff like that. But then you'll go into the camps and you'll see an awful lot of medieval cookery, medieval crafts going on and things like that. People making nets, people fletching arrows, uh, and all that sort of thing, and and learning about that kind of more minute history that tends to appear less in the textbooks, and like the skills, and this is what we have to do. And you, know, you get this common thing of, you know, are you going to eat that? Well, yes, I'm going to eat that. It's a chicken. What do you expect me to do with it? But you know, we've got we, we've got whole sections of the medieval group that I'm part of that just turn up and cook medieval food with medieval stuff. I can imagine yeah. that's pretty nice having that. Yeah, it's well, actually, it depends on the size of the group. If you've got, you know, if you if you're a group of about four or five people, you're on vegetable pottage and that gets real old real quick. You know, but we're part of a larger group that's actually got some thing. And you can, you know, you can get a whole load of like medieval textbooks and medieval recipe books, uh, both kind of primary source and ones that have that have done done research. And you can get that roughly for all classes of food as well. So, you know, if you want to be showing what peasants uh, are having then go for it and if you want to be showing what's happening at royal banquets then you also can the, the information's out there and that, those are really kind of the differences that i would say and then you've got what we do in the foreign field living history group which is less living history and more what we call performance and demonstration so we we're, we'll be giving a talk on something uh, for example we've got a we've got a show called eat knuckles fritz uh, which is all about how to fight in the Second World War when you've run out of ammunition. So it's all the hand-to-hand fighting, the Feb and Sox knife work, 
Um, one of our members, Rory, researched it all from All in Fighting, the 1942 Fairburn and Sykes fighting manual. Uh, and so we will demonstrate what that looks like and they talk about the reasonings behind it. Um, we are the only group in the country that can that does a demonstration of how to be a body snatcher. So we've got a big cross section of a grave with a body in the bottom of it, and we will show you how you actually, because there's an art to getting a body out of a coffin without getting the coffin out of the ground. You know, and a good body snatcher would be in, body gone, grave filled in and out inside of 30 minutes, and we will show how that happens. Uh, we've got other... So we've just done. We, we've just done. This year, we launched uh, the history of bare knuckle boxing. That hurt. And uh, next year, for uh, for the Chalk Valley History Festival, we are introducing uh, the Victorian Gentleman's Guide to Self Defence. So we've got Victorian self defence manuals. So it's like how to fight with your walking cane, with your handkerchief, with your belt, uh, with your bicycle, in fact, and. Uh, and other things like that. So, so that's kind of living history. It's that it, it's that getting it out in the open, getting up close and personal with it. I think I think it's 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 really cool watching those things go on and actually seeing it happen. And I am a hundred percent coming down to watch you get hit with a bicycle next year at Chalk because I don't <laughs> I don't think I can miss that. So so we'd like touching on it, and we're talking about you know different cooking techniques and 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 watching arrows get made and and watching bare knuckle boxing like you said like uh, last year but mm. you know what can it teach you know, the general like the general population about history because you guys are learning how to do it and you guys are are learning the processes from primary sources and and recreating that but the general public is not they're not going through that process of creating those things with you no because what the general public want is to see the result so they will be, and we have this kind of thing in the uh, in the living history group, which is entertain people, and you can educate them against their will. And so they will come along to see a show, and they will learn a whole load of that from that show. They don't need to get into the the, the whys and wherefores of it. So we we would be taking one of the key points that we make in in say the bare knuckle boxing show is we've got the two of us that fight, myself and Rory. Now me, I am a balding. 13 stone bloke that is nearly 50. Okay, I sag in all the wrong bits. I have a body only my wife could love. And sometimes that may be somewhat questionable. And and I was quite nervous about having to kind of like go topless at the Chalk Valley History Festival to do this. And then we've got Rory, who has the body of a chiseled Greek god and not Zeus. You know, so he's like, he's a forester stroke, like lumberjack stroke, tree surgeon by trace. He's always jumping up and down trees with dread. And he has got the kind of physique that, that, that would adorn calendars for, you know, hormonal women. Uh, but the whole point of that is that actually the physique of the champion prize fighter is me, not him. Because I'm the one that can take the damage. Whereas everything that you hit Rory with will hurt a lot. Whereas you hit me, I've got quite a love of beer and pies that will soak a lot of that up. Uh, and so it's been able to been able to show that, and people will watch it, and then they will they they will learn the wise, and they will they will remember it. And if the thing is, it's it's all about getting it all out of glass cases. You know, you go to the Royal Armouries in Leeds, absolutely fantastic museum. Okay, you walk upstairs in their self-defense gallery and you'll see all these weapons, sword canes, knuckle dusters, anything like that. But they're there and they're, they're there and we can see, oh, well, that looks lethal. And then you put it into the sphere of how it's used. I mean, one of the things that we demonstrate in Eat Knuckles Fritz is how you take out a sentry quietly. You know, if anybody out there is eating, put your food down for a moment. Because you would think that you turn up, you take your knife, you creep up behind, and then you run that knife across their throat and hold over their mouth and then drop. And no, because that's not what they taught at all. What you would do is you would take that knife and you ram it right into the side of their neck so it comes out the other side. And then with every bit of inf strength that you've got, you push forward because you can't call for help if you don't have a throat left. And it's, you know, it's designed to be like an instant silent kill. And we will... We, to the best of how we can, we will show that. And people see that difference and that kind of sticks in your mind. There's other things you can do with living history as well. They had a, um, it's like, I think it was Chalk about five years ago, 
now. What they had is they got a whole load of like sides of venison hung up on a target range. And what they did was they shot them with the variety of historic weapons that they had there. So you shot one with a longbow. Uh, we shot one with a musket. Shot one with a brown. Uh, uh, shot one with a Baker rifle. Uh, we shot one with a three hundred three rifle. Uh, one with a Martini Henry. And then they would take it over. And so you'd seen first of all firsthand. You're actually seeing the damage that these bullets and projectiles do to flesh, which you don't get in museums. And then they're taking it over to a surgeon in the in the various camps and what they're doing then is showing you where you can watch it up close how you go about extracting the bullet again you don't get that in a museum i I think bringing it in that way it makes people probably have a little bit more empathy for people from from those times you know if you're figuring out what a bullet actually does to a body and does to flesh and then watching the process taken out you're going to feel more towards those those victims of war. Yeah. You know, it's helping people. It's another layer of understanding. Because if you go to any museum, you may see an interesting artifact. You may see a description. But if you actually want to understand how it's used, you've got to go away and read something else. Now, the bulk of the public over there do not want to read primary sources and so forth. And I am totally on board with that. Even as a historian... I am totally on board with that, particularly when it comes to Georgian handwriting. But you, to, be, to be able to actually see that, where somebody else has done all of the reading and worked out all the interpretation for you to go, this is what it looks like. This is, this is how it acts. And so this is what it smells like. This is what the food tastes like. You know, it's, it's a whole different dimension. I mean, I read once when was, uh, I was doing something on the Titanic this is going to talk on the Titanic. It's a big menu that goes out uh, about the Titanic, the third-class menu that shows gruel. And people go, oh, gruel on the Titanic. Good Lord, that's how much they must have hated steerage passengers. I thought, well, I know what gruel is, but I don't know what it tastes like. So I went and made it. You know, I got an 1885 recipe for gruel, went away, made that. It's not bad, actually. You can live on it. I certainly wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't like to make it a staple of my life. But it wasn't even a staple of workhouse life. And, and you can see at that point, it's not unpleasant. And you can also see if you'd serve it on the Titanic, because you've got really like probably about 700 people there that don't really sail all that often. They're in the base of a ship. It's not fun down there. You know, you, it's something that you're not really going to get seasick with. So, and it becomes, you get then that extra layer of understanding about those people. Yeah, I, I I like that. I like that you're able to build that understanding. But what I what I find what I find interesting is the fact that you actually get to like bearing like getting rid of the general public is that you actually get to experience it yourself and and learn what it's like. And we were talking the other week at Gloucester because I thought this was a great story. How was it actually for you boxing in um, at Chalk in the the bare knuckle boxing fight? that you're doing uh, it was painful i will i will say but that's because though after day one i had to sit rory down and go rory this is how you pull a punch this is how you do a theatrical i got panel beat now and james holland came up to me at the end and said you've done a really good makeup job on those bruises like no james i haven't i really haven't but it it was nerve-wracking actually even though we'd you know we'd rehearsed it we knew what we were doing we'd built into there we'd had a whole load of little signals that said, like, this is when I'm going to do this massive punch towards your face. You might want to consider moving. Um, but there is one area in the routine where actually I can't see where Rory is. So I've just got to go on blind faith. And the whole point of that section was we do, we do like four fights. So we do what people think bare knuckle boxing is, i.e. the Marcus of Queensbury rules just without gloves. And then you get what other people think that the um, bare knuckle boxing is, which is almost like what you see in the movie Snatch, that just violent free-for-all where where you're going to panel beat somebody into the ground. And it's in that section where the, we have a section where I thought, I, you know, I could, I, or I need to play like I've completely lost my rag here. 
So there, there is a moment where I swing, miss, and then just completely follow through with the other hand, just blindly flail behind me. And what I hadn't seen was Rory was already up against the ropes at that point, couldn't go any further backwards. So I just felt my fist connect with his face the way back. Uh, we got a round of applause from the first world war camp up at the top of the hill as well which is, it must have been a good strike but it is it's quite nerve-wracking you know and if you go into even if you go in as a reenactor you go into your first battle and things like that it's it's quite you know you get the sounds you get the smells you first musket volley goes off you can't see a damn thing you know, think how on earth does anybody fight in this I think I think is you know it's even a fraction of what those people were experiencing at that point but what what you're saying, I, I can I can imagine that it's drawing some listeners into to wanting to take part in living history themselves. Now you've just mentioned several different types of, of living history, different ways of getting involved. How how might someone get involved with with living history? Because it from the outside, it yeah. it might look quite overwhelming. Yeah, I mean it's it's if you want to get into living history, and I absolutely would suggest out there that people do. Okay, but there's a few things that you need to bear in mind before you go down that route, because it isn't for everybody. So I think the first thing I would say is, is pick your period. Okay, this is like work out what it is that you're actually interested in and interested in doing. Okay, now you may want to go on and fight the battles, get a musket and take up your take up your musket for God and Parliament. And it's like, great. So you go off and you join one of the English civil war groups. And you can find them, you can search the internet for them. Don't feel that you have to stick within your local area. You don't. Uh, most reenactment and living history groups will go all over the country going at whichever events are going to book them in. So you're going to end up traveling all over the country uh, doing that, which brings me very neatly on to point two. Okay, it is not a hobby. It is a lifestyle choice. We often say to people, get your kids into reenactment because they will never have enough money for drugs. You're going to have a lot of kit to buy. I mean, you generally only need to buy it once until you actually rip it and something. But, you know, once you've bought it once, you've got it. Um, you're going to have things like if you want to become a Civil War musketman, you're going to need a shotgun license. Then you're going to have to go and work on getting a gun. Most groups will kit you out to start, but then they will expect you to go and get your own stuff. And, the, and things like that. What you have to buy very much depends on the period that you got. When I started, I was Wars of the Roses. So they would lend me some kit, but Wars of the Roses, medieval kit, it's very close fitting. So what you want to be doing is you want to be getting it that's actually measured to you. That'll take a little bit of time and a little bit of money. So either have a good job, have a steady job, or have wealthy parents that dearly want you out of the way for the weekend. I think rule number three as well is once you've picked your group is understand that is probably not the group you will stay with. There is, there's a lot of ego and there's a lot of politics that goes on in the reenactment and living history world. It's one of the reasons why myself, Rory and Kyle set up our own group that just avoided all that. I mean, we, like we don't recruit, we just do the things that we want to do. But we have stayed within a couple of other groups as well. But there is a lot of that and you will find probably that the first group that you join doesn't work for you and that's fine you know i'm a very for the last 12 13 years i've been a member of the retinue of his grace the duke of buckingham they were the third group i joined you know so i went in my first one is called the company of palm sunday um i then joined the oxford household neither of those really worked out for me i then joined the clarence household didn't really get on with the way that that ran and then i joined the buckinghams and i found my niche and what you're going to do is you're going to go in there and you're going to find out the things that you like the things that you don't like and you know when other groups are doing things that you want to do a bit more you go and join those groups and that that is absolutely fine but don't think that you have to stay in the sort of first group that you've that you've got but in terms of finding that group what you do is, if you want to get into living history, just start, first of all, going to living history events. Okay, so if you if you want to get involved in late medieval, the Wars of the Roses, well, you've got the Battle of Bosworth, runs twice a, uh, one, once every two years on the anniversary of the Battle of Bosworth, and that's in Leicestershire. Or you've got the Tewkesbury Medieval Festival that happened the second weekend of July. Um, you'll go to that. You can uh, keep an eye on uh, like English heritage and the events that they're running, things like their legendary joust and the Knights Tournament, because they will have living history groups that go along uh, and support those as well. And then you literally march up to one and go, 
I'm really interested in this. How do you join? And most groups will welcome you in with a kind of baying passion that's scary because they're always looking for like new members. And particularly the younger and keener you are, the more likely you're into getting to get a group as well. You know, if you want to go somewhere, if you want to do Civil War, then you start looking at the Civil War battle reenactments that are out there. So you look at something like the Roundhead Association or the, uh, or the, or the King's Army of the English Civil War Society, or you look at the sealed knot and go, okay, you know, where, where can I meet these people? You know, where are they performing? And then you'll go and find them. Uh, and they, they will let you in and they will broadly kit you out. I mean, the first time I went to a civil, civil War battlefield was Marston Moor, and I'd seen them at the Royal Armouries. They were doing a little bit of a demonstration where, one week and because it was the build-up to the anniversary of Marston Moor. And I said to them, okay, how do you go about joining this? And they said, well, why don't you come along next week to Marston Moor? We'll loan you some kit. We will give you an unfireable musket so you don't need a shotgun license. And nobody is going to notice the difference when you're in one cloud of gunpowder that your gun didn't actually go off. And they give you a little bit of marching. And then as you get onto that battlefield and then you had a, well, a wealth of a good time. As it turned out, I didn't really have the funds to start going down the gun route, whereas going down the bow route with medieval was a lot easier. You know, and I was fascinated by the medieval longbowmen. So joining the Wars of the Roses group was, seemed like a good idea. I, th- I th- thank you for that really quite candid uh, set of advice for people because I know I know that getting into these things could be scary and and it can be quite nerve wracking. But you know that yeah. was that was a really nice set of advice there. Yeah, don't be afraid to join a group and don't be afraid to leave a group because you're gonna do both all the way throughout that all the way throughout that career and i've been i i've been doing living history now for for nearly 20 years i've loved it you know but there are times as well when i've gone i oh, just can't and you don't have to go to every event i mean you can if you want uh, there's some people in our group that, that go to absolutely everything going you know i i don't i probably do about one or two events a year with buckingham i'll probably do about 10 or 12 with foreign field because there's only three of us and therefore it's a noticeable gap if i'm not there Plus the one I'm, I, I'm the one that does the bulk of the talking and the presentations, as you can probably tell. So, so it does leave a hole if I'm not around, you know. But the other guys can ca- carry themselves off remarkably well as well. They don't, they don't need me, so don't feel that you have to go to everything. But it can be quite a financial commitment, but they will help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or going to all these these history festivals and so on, it can be time consuming and expensive but they're always fun as i say but now paul yeah, you'll never have to pay for museum admission to a <sighs> castle again that is you that know, is a good whenever point we, whenever we get stopped by the english heritage people that said do you want to buy a membership it's like yeah i do living history in the guy yeah we will not bother them <laughs> well now i think you've been excited for this one paul now final fun question for you okay as we do for all guests here on history of jackson your podcast, History Rage, you're, you're letting historians rage about what really irritates them uh, from history. But I want to ask you, what would you rage about if you had a History Rage episode? Oh, I mean, I've waited for this moment long, have I waited? And there are certain things that you do that require you to be in a big open space, such as like taking on the idea of the two-fingered archer's salute or something like that. The one I think I, I really, really want to rage about uh, if you will forgive me, I could get quite vocal. Oh, let's go. <laughs> as a as a living historian, people often ask me, kind of, what is what if you could go back in time to a period of to a time in history, what time would you go back to? And people often think that I'm going to say, like, oh, I want to go to, I want to see the original V Day parade, or you know, I would maybe have a ringside seat at the Battle of Trafalgar or something like that. It's no, honestly, I would go back to 1483, the Tower of London. And I would kill those two teenagers myself and I would leave absolute proof that I have done it because I am so, so tired of the princes in the tower debate. It makes my eyes bleed. It's like, who the hell cares? Okay, we've got that we know of or that we can at least estimate to accountable level. Okay, there are 49,000 people that die during the Wars of the Roses in a 30-year conflict. Let me put that into a little bit of perspective for you. 
that is 9-11 happening every two years for, for 30 years. That is the Titanic sinking on an annual basis for three decades. And nobody seems to care about these people at all. But we have column inches and books and books upon this uh, of the potential murder of two teenagers. That there isn't actually a shred of evidence that they were murdered. There isn't a shred of evidence that they even died of anything other than old age. And yet, that is that that is the biggest focus of books on Wars of the Roses that you can find. I mentioned Towton earlier on. Like, if you believe the the Italian ambassador, and you should take Italian ambassadors with a pinch of salt, pets in particular in medieval periods, but he did right that 28,000 people lost their lives at the Battle of Towton in a single day. That is more than half the people killed in the entire Wars of the Roses over a 30-year period die in a single day. We can name two of them. And, and, they, and they are nobles. No, nobody should care about the princes in the tower is basically what I want to get out there. I, I, I think you're speaking my language there. I, I hate the fact that so many, by modern standards, standards, it's not a medieval standard, but by modern standards, the amount of war crimes that are committed at the Battle of Towton is unbelievable. And we don't say anything Isn't about it? it. Yeah. No. Nope. Oh, it was just different times, you know. But it's unbelievable. I mean, 28,000 people. That is 1% of the English population. They're done a single day in 12 hours, okay? We barely touched that percentage of the population in the entire First World War, and yet we can name two of them. Just, yeah. And I, you know, I, I'm going to, let me be the first to issue an apology to, like, Matt Lewis and Nathan Amen and, you know, Alison Weir and people that have forged entire careers off the back of the Princes of the Tower, but give it up, okay? Nobody cares or should care at all. And I've even had that printed on a T-shirt. I, I think I think an hour-long rage there with Nathan and Matt. I I would listen to that so so many times. <laughs> I think that's a great episode. But just with that little snippet then of of history rage, people are going to obviously want to listen to the podcast. They're going to want to listen to I you. Hope so. I dearly hope so. <laughs> Where can they find history rage then, and you online? Oh. Okay, so, I mean, you can find History Rage anywhere you get your podcast. So wherever you found History with Jackson, you will also probably find History Rage as well. We do have a website, uh, historyrage.com, that's got all our prior episodes on it and links and how to support the show and where to find us, sign up for the blog. We've got a, we've got a monthly newsletter that tells you who's coming up and, and so forth. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at History Rage, um, Facebook and Instagram also at History Rage, occasionally on TikTok, um, also at History Rage. So so we're all, all, all over the place. And for the living history fans or, or wannabe living historians, where can they find Foreign Field? So Foreign Field, uh, we have a website, which is www.foreign-field.co.uk. Uh, that will show the three of us. We've got an event calendar on there that shows wherever we're going to be going um, and which period and what show that we're doing. We've got everything from medieval armoured combat, going through body snatching, pistol dueling, uh, right up to our most recent in terms of history show, which we're going to be performing the last weekend of October at the RAF Museum in, in Cosford, and that is Play Your Own Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> That's yeah. um, so you can you can track us there. If you're wanting to get into living history, we will advise you can't join Foreign Field. It is only the three of us. We are we are sticking to that, but we can certainly point you in the direction of other groups. And and having listened to History Rage, I, I thoroughly recommend listening to to the podcast. And having watched Foreign Field before I even knew Paul, I thoroughly recommend going and watch you guys as well because you know that those displays that you do are brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, guys, for listening to the podcast. Thank you very much, Paul, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of History of Jackson with Paul Babel from History Rage. That was a great episode. I loved speaking to Paul about his content journey 
and living history as well because we haven't actually spoken about living history on this channel before. Now, if you want to go and check out Paul's podcast, History Rage and Foreign Field, the links will be in the description below. And if you want to continue supporting History of Jackson to carry on doing what we do here, please do head to the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below or head to History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. Next week, we do have another awesome episode lined up. So I will see you in that next episode. And thank you very much for listening to History with Jackson. <laughs>